Welcome today's, to today's Scilab seminar. I'm Michael Lasanti, and today I'm very happy to introduce Lori Craner for our talk. And Lori is an Associate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she is Director of the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory, also known as CUPS, and Co-Director of the new MSIT, MSIT Privacy Engineering Master's Program. She is also a co-founder of local company Wombat Security Technologies. And Lori has authored over 100 research papers on online privacy, usable security, and other topics, and has played a key role in building the usable privacy and security research community, having co-edited co the seminal book, Security and Usability, and founded the Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security, also known as SOUPS. So there's a lot of cups and soups. There's a theme here. She also chaired the Platform for Privacy Preferences Project Specification Working Group and at the W3C and authored the book Web Privacy with P3P. She has served on a number of boards, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation Board of Directors and on the editorial boards of several journals. Lori was previously a researcher at AT&T Labs Research and taught in the Stern School of Business at New York University. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Lori for our talk. All right. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm going to talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing uh, related to uh, privacy on social media and how we can help nudge people to help themselves in protecting their own privacy. Uh, this is work that comes out of actually a large uh, research project here at CMU that involves um, a number of other people, uh, faculty members Alessandro Quisti and Norman Sade, also here in Scilab, um, as well as um, a whole bunch of graduate students and postdocs who have been involved in this project as well. Um, the idea of this project is to look into designing systems that are able to nudge people to protect privacy or security. Um, and the way they work is that we look at the psychological factors and behaviors um, that, uh, that, that cause people to uh, behave in, in particular ways. And we, we're going to try to find ways of exploiting um, some of of the um, natural behaviors that, that people have. Um, so this is based on understanding the types of biases we have when we make decisions. Um, it also is based on understanding the types of problems that people face on social networks and the things that they later come to regret so that we can try to prevent them um, from regretting them. And then um, we're going to actually build prototypes of nudging systems that are going to help prevent people from regretting these things. So to give you some examples of nudges uh, from, from the uh, real world that exist, um, you all have probably seen something like this. This is uh, a, a sign that tells you how fast you're driving. Uh, it doesn't actually stop you from speeding. Uh, you could see it and continue speeding, uh, but it's kind of a nudge. It reminds you that you're going faster than the posted speed limit. Uh, this here is a photograph of an escalator and a staircase next to the escalator. And um, you'll notice that the staircase is painted like a piano keyboard. And it turns out that when you actually step on the steps here, it makes sounds like a piano keyboard. And this was installed to try to nudge people to take the steps instead of the escalator. Uh, and uh, they found that it was actually really effective. Um, before they had installed this, almost everybody took the escalator. Um, and once they installed it, they had a huge increase in the number of people taking the staircase uh, because it made it fun to take the staircase, which is also the healthier thing to do. Okay, so can we do this for privacy? Uh, so here are some ideas of how we might do this. You know, if we can make privacy something that is appealing, if we can um, describe the benefits and make it seem like this would be really fun or cool or pretty or sexy to do privacy, maybe we can get people uh, being more privacy protective. Uh, one way to do this would be to try to reinforce positive privacy behavior. So we could have 
um, rewards. We could have uh, software that has uh, positive indicators when you do something that is the, the pri privacy friendly thing. Um, we could also do the opposite. We could have negative indicators or warnings when you do something that is going to be impacting your privacy in a negative way. Um, so, you know, we could have a, a notice like, you know, do you want your mother to read this? Uh, that might get people's attention. Uh, we could also do things to make privacy information more salient so that we don't forget about it. We, we have a constant reminder. Uh, so here's an example of a tool that we built a while ago, um, which gives you um, information about the privacy policies of the website you're visiting. And so you see a red uh, bird in the corner of your web browser when you're at a site with a, a bad privacy policy. You see a green bird when it's a good privacy policy. And that's always persistent there in the corner of your browser window as a reminder about the privacy policy of the website. Uh, here's another tool that we built uh, for a search engine. And this one annotates all the search results with a privacy meter so that you can see at a glance how good the privacy policies are at the sites you're visiting. Um, and again, this is a way that, that it helps um, uh, you take privacy into account when you're choosing which website to visit. And we actually did a study and demonstrated that people really did take that information into account. Uh, here, here's another one. Uh, this is a prototype that one of my students built uh, for Android, uh, for the Android App Store. Uh, what if we had privacy information uh, directly in the App Store before you downloaded an app? And it might look like this. It says privacy facts, and it provides information about the types of um, uh, of data policies that this app would have. And uh, we did a, a lab study and an online study and demonstrated that when we had that information, it impacts people's decision making when they're choosing which apps to download. Um, another way that uh, we can make privacy more salient is uh, through, through uh, symbols about access control that are directly on the information uh, that it relates to. So this is in Facebook. Uh, the interface has changed a little bit, but uh, this is how it looked a couple years ago, where you have that symbol that shows you whether you're sharing it only with your friends or whether you're sharing it more widely. Um, we built a tool uh, a few years ago with a, a front end for the Tor anonymity system. And we had the problem that, that Tor users said when they were using Tor, they, they had no feedback that said it was working. And they sometimes forgot what state it was in, whether it was on or off. Uh, so we came up with these symbols. And when the fox, uh, when you can see the whole fox's head, you're not anonymous. And when the fox has a bag over his head, then you know you're anonymous. Uh, and so that was a direct, uh, persistent feedback that says that, that Tor is actually working. Right. Another idea is to provide more information about the consequences of data sharing. Uh, and so this is a tool that we built that I'll tell you more about later, um, where as you're typing uh, posts on Facebook, you can see information about who might see the post that you're about to, to make. Um, and so in this case, this is somebody who has the uh, public sharing setting selected. And so we pick some random uh, pictures of people who are on Facebook, and we say these people and anyone on the internet uh, will be able to see your post. Okay. Another approach uh, would be to make it easier to select privacy than to, than to select no privacy. Uh, so we could have default settings that default to privacy, which is fairly unusual in, in most of the software we're using today. Typically, the default settings are not defaulting to privacy. Um, we could make the privacy controls more, more usable. We could make it so you don't have to dig through multiple layers of menu items in order to find them. Um, or alternatively, we could artificially add friction to the privacy reducing choices. Um, that might uh, make the user experience uh, not quite as nice for people who, would who are okay with um, giving up their privacy, but it would provide an advantage to privacy. So imagine every time you try to post a photo publicly that you had an extra confirmation that would pop up. Um, so this is the sort of thing that, it, you know, from a user interface design perspective, people would say, well, this is a lousy user interface. Um, uh, but it is, is another example of how you can add friction to the process. 
Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about a number of studies that we have been doing um, as part of the Nudge Project and related uh, work here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some studies we did trying to understand what users actually regret on, on social networks, and we'll focus on both Facebook and Twitter. Um, then we're going to uh, talk about a study about how users on social networks currently are avoiding regret through self-censorship on Facebook. And then um, I'm going to tell you about some of the prototypes of nudges that we've built for Facebook and a field study that we conducted in order to test the effectiveness of these nudges. Okay, so uh, the first study is, uh, is our uh, Facebook regret study. And uh, you can see there, there's a whole bunch of uh, co-authors on all of these studies I'm going to talk about today. Right, so this study uh, started uh, as we were trying to understand, you know, what was it that people were regretting uh, on Facebook. And we'd heard a lot of anecdotal evidence from media reports that people seemed to be doing a lot of, you know, really silly or downright stupid things as far as what they were posting on Facebook. Um, and here's an example that came from the front page of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, and it was a story about uh, this guy who dresses up in a pierogi costume at um, Pirates games. And he was fired from that job where he was paid all of like $25 a week. He was fired from that job uh, because he had posted something on his Facebook page that was derogatory about the pirates, who at the time were losing every game. Um, and so, uh, so he was Facebook friends with people in the, um, in the management office of the pirates, and so they fired him. Um, and, uh, you know, th this, this uh, doesn't seem uh, too exciting, but it actually made front page news at the time. Um, and I think the reason why the media and the public were so uh, excited about it um, was that at the time, people didn't realize you could get fired for something that you posted on Facebook. Um, since then, there's been a lot more of that, and, and I think people are a lot more aware of it. But at the time, um, they weren't. And so I started getting media calls uh, because people knew I, I was doing uh, Facebook privacy research. And, and they, they said, how could this be? How could this guy get fired for posting something on Facebook? Right. Uh, at this point, there are whole uh, multiple blogs devoted to stories of people who are getting fired on, on Facebook. Um, so we were wondering um, whether this was uh, typical or just, you know, a few outlying cases that the media reports. And, you know, what is it that the typical user is doing on Facebook that they are regretting uh, doing? Why are they taking these regrettable actions? Um, what sort of consequences are they facing? And how do they handle the aftermath, aftermath of these uh, actions? So we conducted uh, a series of several studies. Uh, we started off with an online survey about uh, privacy on social media, and we had a few questions that were specifically talking about regrets. Uh, then we did a series of semi-structured interviews in our laboratory. Um, these were in-depth interviews where we talked to people about incidents that they regretted on social media. Um, these were interesting, but they're very time consuming to do. Uh, we found that from each person we talked to, we typically get like one or two things that they regretted. Um, and I think users were fairly uncomfortable talking to a person face to face about these things that they were, were you know, regretting the fact that they did. So then we looked uh, to other types of studies that we could do that might uh, be more efficient in getting us uh, useful data, and we decided to do some online surveys. We used Amazon's Mechanical Turk in order to do these uh, surveys. For those of you who may not be familiar with that, uh, Amazon has a service where you can post uh, small jobs that you will pay somebody a dime or a dollar uh, to do for you online, and surveys work really well in this format. So we can post a survey um, and collect uh, responses from hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, we pay Amazon. Amazon then, then hands out those dimes or dollars to all the people who took the survey. Um, and so we can very quickly get, get a lot of data. Um, so the first uh, survey that we did, um, we uh, recruited Facebook users who, uh, who, who, we advertised for Facebook users who said that they had done something they regretted on Facebook. Um, and we asked them a whole bunch of questions about that. Uh, the second time we did it, we recruited people who were active Facebook users but didn't mention anything about regret in the advertisement. Um, that way we could get a sample of people who may or may not have regretted something and then we could find out whether in fact they, they had regretted and get an idea of how frequent this regret would be. 
So from, from that last study, we found out that regrets are not unusual. So uh, our sur survey participants, 57% um, of them said that they had regretted something they did on Facebook. Uh, so it is a, a fairly common thing to, to have happen. Right, so uh, we, we have uh, at this point um, samples from about 1,500 uh, survey respondents about the things that they regret on Facebook. And so we looked at what is it that people are regretting. And so this is in proximate, approximate order of, uh, of uh, popularity with the uh, most regretted, or the things that happen most frequently on the top. Um, so people tend to regret posts um, where they're sharing too much information about themselves or about somebody else. That, that is uh, a lot of the anecdotes that we got had to do with the sharing too much information. Um, uh, posts related to sex, uh, frequently regretted. Um, relationships, profanity, uh, alcohol and drug use, uh, jokes, uh, those tend to be jokes that the person who posted them thought they were funny, but their friends apparently did not think they were so funny. Uh, lies, uh, these were either direct lies or posting something which was truthful but caught somebody in a previous lie uh, because you were now posting the truth. Um, and then information about your work or company. Um, and this is sometimes uh, people bad-mouthing their company. It could also be uh, posting information that the company uh, considered proprietary and didn't want posted. Um, it could be things about uh, uh, saying that you were sick um, and, and then having a post that indicated you were actually taking the day off to go on vacation. All of these things about work or the company um, also were, were a pretty popular category. Um, besides specific posts, we found that people also regretted other types of activities. Uh, so friending and unfriending was sometimes a source of angst for people, and they regretted having friended a particular person or having unfriended them. Um, people also regretted doing some photo tagging, especially when they tagged a friend in a photo and then that friend got mad at them because they didn't want to be tagged in the photo. Um, and then some people talked to us about the uh, Facebook apps that they used and said that they regretted using them. This usually occurred when someone said, you know, I used this app and then it started spamming all of my friends and I regretted that. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, from the data that we collected. Um, here's an example of about a post about other people. Um, so I posted a comment on a friend's private problem they were having with a possible cheating act done by their husband. Uh, so here, here you know, th this is too much information. Um, also, it's related to a relationship, so both uh, common themes. Um, personal issues. I had broken out in hives and I was posting about the discomfort. I don't think all my friends needed to know about the itchiness and swelling. I regretted oversharing. Okay. Um, example about sex. I said something alluding to the fact that I had spent the night with someone and my mother saw it. I still haven't heard the end of it. Um, yeah, we, we had a lot of mention of uh, mothers finding out about things based on what they posted on Facebook. Um, there were other people too who found out b based on Facebook, but mothers seemed to be something that, <laughs> that particularly uh, concerned people. Um, likewise, here, uh, here's a drug post. Again, the problem uh, is that the mother found out. I regretted posting a picture of me smoking marijuana at a party. People in my family seen it and other people I didn't want seeing it. My mom told me it was embarrassing for her. Okay, so another, another example. Um, here's an example of a lie. The photos I uploaded got a friend in trouble by catching him in a lie. He promised someone that he wouldn't drink that night, but a few photos show him with a beer in his hand the photographic evidence of, of showing that somebody had been lying. That, we saw that quite a bit. Um, bad mouthing a job. Here, when I bad mouthed my job due to disciplinary, I was on for BS stuff. My managers are my friends on Facebook and ended up ugly at work. I was mad. I said it out of anger and not thinking. Okay, so here's somebody criticizing their job uh, on Facebook. Okay, so we uh, wanted to understand why did people all do all of this? What, why, why did they do these things um, which they came to later regret? Um, and what we saw was that the most common reason is that they were excited. And usually they were excited in a negative way. So they were angry, they were in a really bad mood, they really felt like they needed to get something off their chest or vent about something. Um, and that caused them to say a lot of things that they regretted. Uh, in some cases, they were excited in a positive way, um, and they were just so happy to share good news that they didn't really think very much. Um, which brings us to the next thing. A lot of people said, I just wasn't thinking. 
All right, no, no particular reason why they weren't thinking, but what they expressed was they just weren't thinking. So that, that seems to happen a lot, lack of thinking. Um, <laughs> another problem is unintended audience. Uh, so people said, I don't regret posting it. I wanted to post it, but I regret that I had my access control set in a particular way so that s certain people saw it who I didn't want to see it. Um, so that was a big problem. Uh, we also have the people who kind of misjudged what cool and funny would be. You know, they posted it because they thought it was very cool or very funny, um, but they got feedback from their friends that other people did not agree with that assessment. Um, then there were the people who were under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, and then the last category is the people who didn't mean to post it. Um, so those are people, uh, especially with photos or videos, who posted the wrong thing. Um, and what they ended up posting was a lot more embarrassing um, than the thing that they, they actually uh, uh, intended to post. All right, so an example of high emotions here. I posted a negative comment to a man I care about, emotions high with frustrations lashing out at him when I should instead be in more control. Um, we saw a number of these examples of people saying that, uh, you know, they were mad at, at uh, someone they were in a relationship with. They immediately posted. Uh, later, when they calmed down and they were no longer so mad at them, um, they really regretted that they had said that. And, and in some cases, they were able to repair the damage, and in other cases, they were not. Uh, here's an example of venting. I posted something about my feelings about an argument I had with a friend. It was fairly obvious to those who knew about the argument who I was referring to. I felt the need to vent and get the situation off my chest. Also, I'm sure a small part of me wanted her to read it and feel bad. So, um, here's an example of someone who thought it was funny at the time. Here's a photo of me at a Halloween dressed in a sexy nurse's costume. I am male. It seemed very funny at the time of posting. Um, all right, I mentioned that unintended audience was a big problem that we saw. So we uh, dig down further into unintended audience to understand what was going on there. Um, we actually found that more than a third of the regretted posts involved some sort of unintended audience. Um, and for 70% of those unintended audience posts, the unintended audience were people they were actually friends with on Facebook. So it wasn't that they accidentally posted it publicly or, uh, or, or that you know, somebody showed it to someone else. For 70% for of them, they posted it to friends only, and it was actually some of their friends that they didn't really want to see it. Um, now, there were some 10% where they posted it to friends only, their friends saw it, and then their friends shared it with other people, and that's where the problem was. Um, but a uh, really big problem here of people who actually need to post to a subset of their friends, not the whole list. Um, we also looked at uh, who were these people on their friends list that they didn't want to see the post. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the, the distant strangers who I friended a long time ago and forgot I friended. A lot of them were actually their friends and their extended family. So their face-to-face, -face, real life friends and their extended family uh, were often mentioned as people who saw the post who they, they decided they didn't really want to have seen it. And so what is the uh, consequence of, uh, of, of this regret? Um, and this is, again, in rough order of uh, frequency. So feeling guilty was the biggest consequence. Um, and uh, you might think, well, yeah, we all feel guilty about lots of things. What, you know, what's the big deal about that? Uh, we also asked people to describe the strength of their regret. And the people who said they felt guilty also indicated a very high level of strength of that regret. So this was something that really, really bothered them. Um, likewise, being embarrassed was up there, and, and again, they, they really, it really bothered them. Um, we also had people who said that their, their relationship was hurt, and in many cases they were unable to repair it. Um, they offended people. Uh, they were misunderstood, and this ended up being a problem. And then at the bottom of the list is the one that is perhaps the most tangibly uh, important one, and that is that they actually got into trouble. Um, so getting into trouble might mean that you lose your job um, or that you get in trouble at school um, or something along those lines. In some cases, actually getting in trouble with the law uh, was also part of the, the getting into trouble. Um, we didn't see nearly as many examples of that in our data set, although it, it did still actually occur quite a bit. Okay, so um, after we did the Facebook studies, we uh, decided to look at Twitter as well to see uh, how that was similar and how that was different. 
Um, and in this case, we wanted to look not only um, at Twitter, but also at what happens in real life conversations. Uh, we'd had some, uh, some criticism of our Facebook studies that, well, yeah, people do all these things they regret on Facebook, but people also do things they regret in real life. So how is this any different? Um, so it turns out there's actually um, a large set of uh, research that has been done on regret in conversations. Um, and we thought that, that as opposed to regret about life events, you know, deciding what school to go to or who to marry or things like that, um, conversational regret seemed like a more direct comparison with a social network regret. So, um, so we, we did a comparison um, with, uh, with what happens um, in conversations to what happens on Twitter. Um, now, compared to a, a conversation, Twitter allows for a much wider audience, since typically people have conversations with one other person or a small number of people. Um, also, Twitter doesn't have the face-to-face -face channel that you typically have when you're in conversation in a room with people. Um, and Twitter also has increased persistence. So when you're talking to someone, usually it's not being recorded or written down, whereas on Twitter, it's by its very nature, it's being recorded. Now, um, once again, we saw a lot of high profile Twitter regrets. Um, for example, Anthony uh, Weiner was a famous one. Um, and we wanted to see whether these things happen to you know, the average person as well. Okay, so we uh, wanted to do a study where we could actually compare directly the conversational regrets with the uh, Twitter regrets. We wanted to understand what states actually led to regret, what types of re regret would, had occurred, um, how people became aware of the fact that their message was a problem and then came to regret it, and then what repair strategies they used to try to cope with the regretted message. We did a large-scale online survey, again using Mechanical Turk, um, and we recruited people who were frequent Twitter users and reported a regret. Um, so the, the, in this case, we were selecting specifically for people who said that they had a regret. Um, we had two conditions, a conversation condition and a Twitter condition, and we randomly assigned people. So for the people who were assigned to the conversation condition, they had a regret on Twitter, but we didn't actually ask them about that. We only asked them about their regret in conversation. Um, in each case, we asked them to recall just one example of a regret, in, depending on which condition they were in, and then we asked them a bunch of questions about it. Um, we had a bunch of open response questions that we went through and systematically coded into different categories using the same coding technique that was done in the conversational regrets literature. Okay, so looking at the states that lead to regret, um, we found that with Twitter, um, negative emotional states are very common. And so this is very similar to what we saw in the Facebook study. Stress, anger, and frustration are the, are the major factors that lead to regret. Um, we also saw some positive emotion, but just like with the Facebook study, it was less common than the negative emotion. Um, we also looked at the types of regret, and here um, this is a little bit different uh, than the Facebook study because we asked the question in a little bit different way and coded it a little bit differently. Um, uh, but what we see is that the kinds of things that people regret, one of the biggest ones is where people directly criticize somebody else. Um, another uh, is a direct attack. Uh, so uh, not only are you criticizing them, but you're actually going a step further and attacking them. Um, then implied criticism, where you don't, you're not specifically criticizing them, but based on something you say, there's some, some criticism um, that's implied. Um, expressive, th this is uh, basically expressing an opinion or feelings or beliefs. Um, things that reveal too much information, and then blunders. Now, blunders are something we didn't see as much on Facebook uh, as we saw uh, on Twitter, but we did see some in the Facebook sample as well. And so this is, um, I, I mistyped something. That wasn't actually what I, what I meant to say. Okay, so um, here are some examples. Um, uh, as I said, being critical of others was a big problem, and this occurred both in the, uh, the Twitter set and the conversational set, um, where, where people, people said things uh, that were critical, and then somebody called them on it, and they came to regret it. Um, we saw lots of blunders on Twitter. We didn't see them very much in conversation because you don't make typos when you're talking. Um, so you can miss say things when you're talking, but that doesn't happen as frequently as typos, which happen all the time on Twitter. Uh, 
Um, expressive content, as I said, was also something um, that, uh, that, that people said was getting them into trouble on Twitter. All right, we also looked at how people became aware that they'd done something that maybe they should regret. Um, and so if you look at the conversational regrets here, um, you can see that um, uh, people are getting a lot of feedback from their audience. So if you look at the combination of somebody in the audience said something to me, uh, there was an action from someone in the audience, or the body language, you can see those, those add up um, to about half the sample. Um, and so people are getting a lot of feedback uh, from others that is, um, that is helping them say, oops, maybe I said something that I shouldn't have said, uh, and, and maybe I should regret it. Um, so, you know, we see all the time, uh, uh, you know, the, the looks on people's faces, um, and, you know, this extreme one, when she began to cry, I realized how much I hurt her, right? When you see someone crying based on something you said, that, that's, you know, a pretty good indication uh, of what's going on here. Um, on the other hand, on Twitter, what we see is that self-realization is really the big factor here. We're not getting a whole lot of feedback from the audience. Uh, and so we had a lot of people who said, you know, when I went back later and reread my tweet, then I suddenly realized, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and so that, that, is, um, that is a really different uh, pattern than what we saw in conversation. Um, and so as a result of that, um, as a result of that, we also see that the amount of time it takes for people uh, to become aware is very different on Twitter than in conversation. In conversation, people almost immediately realize that they said something they shouldn't have, whereas on Twitter, a lot of it was, you know, the next day people would realize that. All right, so the conclusion of our Twitter study um, was that, that uh, we did see a lot of uh, regret for, uh, for messages that were critical of other people. Um, we saw that people um, uh, became aware of regret hours or days later. Um, we found that Twitter participants were relying a lot on self-awareness in order to uh, d discover this regret because they didn't have cues. Um, and, uh, we also found that once people um, uh, w once people were aware of the regret, uh, they tended to uh, to try to repair it through deleting uh, their tweets and apologizing. Okay, so um, besides looking at these um, these regrets, we also wanted to look at the other side. How are people preventing regrets today? Um, and one way that people prevent regrets is that they censor themselves. They think about something they want to post, and then before they type it in, or maybe they type it in, but before they hit post, they say, no, nah, I shouldn't do that. I, I, I think I'm going to uh, hold that thought, not actually type it in. Um, and, you know, this is something which, uh, you know, can sometimes require a lot of self-control um, and, you know, a lot of practice in trying to figure out when it's best not to say anything at all. So what we did in this uh, study is we had, um, uh, we recruited participants to, t to do a diary study for seven days. Um, and we wanted them to think about all of the times that they were uh, considering posting something on Facebook and decided not to. Um, and we needed to come up with a way of capturing this because this happens all the time throughout the day. Um, and so what we did is we asked people to send us a text message every time this happened. Um, and then at the end of the day, they would log on to our website and, um, and we gave them a survey about all the times that they had texted us throughout the day saying that they were about to post something and then decided not to. Um, then uh, at the end of the study, we had an hour-long uh, interview with each participant to uh, dig deeper and understand more about why they did what they did. I'm just going to briefly summarize the results here. There's a lot more in the paper. Um, so we looked at what were the reasons that people said they decided not to share something. Um, a big reason was presentation of self. You know, they were about to share something, and then they said, no, this is going to make me look bad. This is not the image that I want to present to the world, so I'm not going to do it. Um, another reason was they thought about it and decided that they might offend somebody if they said this, um, and so they decided not to. Um, another one, uh, which, which was a little bit of, of a surprise to me anyway, was people said, 
I thought about posting it and I realized it was just boring or repetitive, right? And I didn't want people to, to like think of me as being boring or I, you know, I didn't want to be the one who's like posts a picture of their, you know, dinner every night. That's just boring. Um, and so, uh, so people decided not, not to post some things. Uh, people also said they wanted to avoid getting into an argument or a discussion. You know, they had something that they thought was interesting, they'd like people to hear it, but they knew that if they posted it, like, all their friends would start arguing with them about it, and they, they didn't really want to engage in that. Um, and then there were people who said that they didn't post just because it was inconvenient at the time. Uh, you know, they, they had a mobile device and it was something that would, you know, take too long to type in or something like that. So this is not really uh, censoring because they think that they, that they would regret it, but it was just, it was another, another reason why you would decide not to post. It was too inconvenient to do it. Um, we also uh, looked to see whether there was anything that could, you know, if, if Facebook was different in some way, uh, would there have been a way that enabled people to go ahead with the post? Um, and a big uh, issue was that people said, if I could have posted this for just a subset of my friends, then I would have gone ahead and posted it. Um, now, Facebook does allow you to post things for a subset of your friends. Um, but uh, people said that either they didn't know how to do that or it was going to be too difficult or complicated or they didn't trust in their own ability to get it right. And so therefore, they decided not to post at all instead of trying to define that subset of their friends to receive a particular message. Okay, so uh, after we had uh, done all these studies about what people regretted and what people were doing to prevent regret, then we started developing um, some tools to try to uh, help people prevent regret. Um, and so we designed some Facebook nudges. Um, so in, in designing these nudges, we wanted to see um, what were the underlying causes of regrets that we thought we might be able to do something about with a nudge. Um, and basically, we focused in on three areas. One was the not thinking, which, as you recall, uh, we found a lot of not thinking. And we said, all right, is there anything we can do to get people to think? Um, we also saw an underlying cause was people who were not aware of how their post would be received. And so uh, we wanted to see if there was a way that we could help give people some insights up front about how their post might be received. Um, and then the third area was people were not sure who would actually see the post in the audience, that they forgot that there were people in their, in their uh, friends list um, who they might not want to see the post. And so we wanted to see if we could make people more aware of their audience. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so uh, we, we focused on building uh, three nudge tools, one to get people to, to stop and think, one to make people aware of how people would perceive their post, and one to remind people about their audience. So let's start with the uh, stop and think. Uh, so the idea here was that when you click post, you would have a countdown timer. And that timer would give you 10 seconds to reflect on your post and possibly change your mind. Um, so what it says in that yellow bar is you will have 10 seconds to cancel after you post this update. Um, and when you click post, it starts counting down and you can actually see 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, now, if you uh, decide you don't want to wait 10 seconds, there's a post now button. So you can you know, just go ahead and post it without waiting. Um, at any time, you can click the edit button to go and uh, edit what you typed or the cancel button to you know, get rid of it altogether. All right, our second nudge was what we call the sentiment nudge. And the idea here was to give you feedback about how this post might be received. So when you click post, it does an evaluation of the words in your post. Uh, we used a standard algorithm for, uh, for measuring sentiment. Um, it's not really the greatest algorithm. It, it tells you whether something is uh, positive, very positive, negative, or ne very negative, but it doesn't handle sarcasm very well and a number of other problems. Um, and so, uh, so it, it, it uh, you know, if you say I am angry, that it got, but there were a lot of other things um, where, where they were more subtle that it didn't always have the right answer. Um, but for whatever it was worth, uh, we, we did provide uh, this feedback here, so other people may perceive your post as negative, uh, was the kind of feedback that we were giving people there. Um, and again, they had the countdown timer um, with the same options as before. Our last nudge is what we call our profile picture nudge. Um, and then the idea here was whoever your audience was, uh, so in this case you see public, uh, we randomly select five profile pictures for people in that category, and we show them here. 
Um, so if you had, uh, let's, let's say you had s s selected friends only and you had uh, 300 people on your friend list, it would pick um, those five people and it would say these people and 295 others uh, we'll see your post. And every time you post, we randomly pick a different selection. So the idea is that over time, um, you're going to start to see pictures of people that you might have forgotten you were friends with. Um, you also get that kind of visceral reaction. So I was playing with this um, uh, myself for a while. And um, uh, one of the people I'm friends with is actually my grandmother. Um, and I can tell you that every time my grandmother's picture popped up there, it really did make me kind of think twice before I posted whatever I was going to post. Okay, so uh, we wanted to do a study to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of these nudges. Um, and we wanted to understand the impact on their posting behavior, what people would actually think about the nudges, and whether they seem to be effective in preventing regret. We did this study as an exploratory study. Uh, it, it turns out that it's, uh, it, it's a very difficult study to do, and it was very difficult to get a large data set and to keep our software working uh, over the course of a several week study. Um, Facebook is constantly changing their user interface. Um, in order to build these nudges and have them work on Facebook, um, we were doing things that, that um, were not necessarily consistent with uh, the preferred way that Facebook would like you to uh, attach things through their API. Um, and so we had a lot of workarounds. Um, every couple of days, and it really was like every two or three days, when Facebook changed some small thing in their interface, we'd have to adjust our code. Um, and so it, was, it, it became a very difficult study. We also needed um, participants who were willing to let us uh, gather everything they did on Facebook. And that's every keystroke. So things they typed and then deleted, we wanted to see the original thing and the deletion and everything. Um, so, so we need to recruit people who are willing to do that and who um, almost exclusively use Facebook with Chrome um, because our, our tools would only work with the Chrome web browser. So as you can imagine, uh, recruiting participants to do this uh, became difficult, and keeping them in the study over several weeks uh, became difficult. Um, but we did uh, actually recruit um, people and managed, managed to, to keep um, a couple dozen people in the study uh, for the whole time. Um, basically what we did is for the first 10 days of the study, we had them use Facebook normally. And um, the only thing that our tool did was collect data on them uh, so that we could get a baseline without any nudges. Then about 10 days into the study, we turned on one of the nudges for each participant. Um, and so we had a third of the participants who had each nudge. Uh, and then we continued collecting data. And we were able to see whether there were any differences between their behavior in the first half or the second half. Uh, we had follow-up surveys uh, for everybody. And then uh, for some of the participants, we also conducted interviews uh, to talk more about what, what happened. It, so uh, we had 21 participants who actually completed the study. We started off with many more, but by the end, we had 21 participants. Um, and uh, uh, they were um, um, about half male and female, a little bit more female, um, kind of on the younger end of the spectrum, um, but not all students. We, we did have a variety there. The, uh, the metrics that we used uh, in order to try to, to make some uh, judgments here, um, we looked at behavioral data. We wanted to see whether they actually were changing their privacy settings throughout the study. Uh, we wanted to see any time they canceled or edited a post, uh, how frequently they were posting, and then also how sensitive the topics were that they were posting about. So we actually um, uh, had research assistants who read uh, a lot of posts and rated them as far as the sensitivity of, of the post. You know, was it stuff that was about um, you know, very sensitive personal relationships or medical issues or things like that. We had a, a list of different sensitive topics. Um, we also, uh, from our survey, we asked the, uh, the participants their opinions about uh, th their experience. Um, and so those were our, our main metrics. We had hoped to uh, be able to do a lot more quantitative uh, analysis, um, but we had a pretty small sample size. And because of the technical difficulties with keeping um, all the data collection working properly as Facebook changed, we actually lost a lot of data that we would have otherwise had. So in the end, we actually did not have enough data that we were able to do quantitative analysis. 
Right, so um, an overview of our results, and there's a lot more detail again in, in our papers. Um, we found that the, the profile picture nudge um, was fairly successful in increasing awareness of audience. Um, when we, in the survey and in the interviews, uh, a lot of people told us, um, yeah, I, I saw people pop, popped up there that I had forgotten that I was friends with, um, or I saw that and I decided maybe I wouldn't post that. Um, it led people to actually cancel some posts that led them to go and unfriend people. Um, so that seemed to be something that at least anecdotally um, was having an impact. Um, we also saw some anecdotal evidence that the timer was causing people to stop and think. Again, people talked to us about that and they told us that during that 10 seconds while they were waiting, they actually did change their mind about some things. Um, the sentiment nudge, on the other hand, was kind of a disaster. Um, and uh, part of this was due to the fact that the algorithm for <laughs> for uh, sentiment wasn't very good. Um, so people did not like the fact that it could not detect their sarcasm, for example. Um, but there were also some other issues. Um, when we told people that people would view their posts as positive, uh, people said, okay, great. You know, like what, that, that doesn't really give you any useful information. So really the only useful information is when it's negative, especially if you were not aware that it was negative. But if you're in a bad mood and somebody tells you that you're saying something negative, um, chances are you're not going to respond very well. And you know, our participants said, yeah, damn right that's negative. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the way that we delivered the message um, was also problematic. Uh, so we determined that um, while we still thought there were some good ideas behind having a sentiment nudge, in order to do it right, you would need a better algorithm and you would need a different way of delivering the message to people so that it was something that was going to be more useful and they'd be more receptive to it. And we do have some ideas about that, um, but for the moment, we've, we've kind of put that on hold. Um, so uh, our conclusion from this uh, was that, that we did see enough anecdotal evidence to convince us that the nudges were doing something. Right. Um, especially the first two nudges that I talked about, um, we did see, see that, that for some people they seem to actually be pretty effective. Um, however, we have a really small sample size here um, and there were a lot of technical glitches, so uh, clearly we needed to do the study again um, in order to, to get uh, better data about this. Um, we also had a lot of ideas from this about uh, small things that we could do to improve those particular nudges. Um, the countdown timer in particular, uh, there was some confusion with, with the user interface components that uh, we thought could be fixed. Um, and so we decided that we needed to uh, do this again. So uh, we developed a, a new nudge that we call the super nudge that basically takes the picture nudge and the countdown timer and puts them together and fixes all of the, uh, the obvious problems that we had found with those two nudges. Um, we also uh, re-architected our system so that we'd have better data collection and event logging. Um, we actually hired um, a programmer to uh, be on call so that every time Facebook changed their interface, we could immediately fix the problem uh, before our users um, uh, encountered it and we lost data. Uh, and so we, uh, we subsequently did um, two more field trials with 40 participants. Um, and uh, we're, we're in the process of, uh, of working on the paper for that. Uh, but basically what we found is that here we still uh, didn't have uh, large amounts of quantitative data, um, but we were able to measure that for about half our participants, we found examples of how they were positively impacted by nudges. Um, so typically this was uh, cases where the participant told us in the survey that, um, that, that they could think of a specific instance where they had changed their mind about what they were going to post as a result of the nudge, or we could see that they actually clicked edit or cancel and re they reworded what they were going to post. Um, there were some people who said after using it, no, I don't need this, I would never use it. Um, although a lot of those people then said, but I have friends who could use this, um, which was kind of interesting. Um, but there was, uh, there was also a set of people who, who uh, understood it and thought that this was something that they thought would be very useful to have. Um, so 
we think that, uh, that it does show some promise. Um, we're not sure where we're going to go with this now um, because uh, we, we've also realized that running these kinds of studies when you're not Facebook is actually really difficult to do. Um, and so, you know, Facebook could, could very easily implement these sorts of, of nudges and um, for, you know, for a subset of their population and gather statistics. But when you're trying to build something on top of Facebook, it, it's actually very hard to do that. Um, so we're exploring some other ideas now um, for other types of nudges, not just on social media. All right, I'm going to end there, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Yes? Use the uh, microphone so that it's recorded. Uh, you press the um, push button. Uh, <laughs> Hold it down. Right. Um, so I don't know how much data you have, but instead of looking at sentiment analysis, have you thought of looking at like privacy analysis? So you would train like a binary classifier using sort of your n-grams or whatever you want, and you'd use unfold cross-validation, and then say, you know, happy face, this is private, or maybe have like a person with a face and then put a mask on it, right, depending on the result of the classifier. So how much data do you have, I guess? <laughs> how much data? Um, well, so, so we, we have um, for about 75 users a few weeks of everything they posted on Facebook. It's basically what we have. Um, and uh, we could certainly go through and manually code sentiment or how private it is or, or whatever. Um, so we could do that. Um, so based on, um, on the regret study, I'm not sure that how private it is is as useful as the sentiment. So it seemed like um, people were, for the most part, aware of that, although there were definitely the cases where they posted something about a relationship that maybe having having that say, you know, that seems too, too private, too much personal information, um, might have helped them. Um, we focused on the sentiment because of uh, people who seem to have misjudged their audience as to or as what, what the audience would think um, about it. Um, but yeah, there are definitely a lot of different axes for, for where somebody needs that feedback that, that what you're posting might not be what you want to post, um, and, and there is more that could be done with it, so yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, you mentioned about doing different in the future, different nudges for different types of things beyond social media, and one of the things I was wondering about was third parties, sort of like data brokers, things like that. Now, clearly, it would be uh, much more difficult uh, to have a sort of like a regret of, you know, what you just browsed to or how that would translate into a regret or anything like that, but I'm wondering if there would be any way to sort of create a similar set of system uh, like to what, say, Axiom might use, and then at the end of your day of like whatever you've done on the computer, you just click the button that would say, oh, based on your browsing habits for the day, these are the sort of advertisements you can ex expect to be, you know, pitched or something like that. And then you can compare those with what you actually get advertised. Uh, or something to that effect could be interesting. Yeah, I, I actually have uh, several students who are talking about ideas kind of in, in that space. Uh, in other research, we've been looking at online behavioral advertising um, and what people's attitudes are about that. Um, and um, we've been doing a lot of sort of hypotheticals, but we've been talking about building a plugin that would show people their actual, you know, who is actually tracking them and what they're going to find out from that um, and, and then showing that to people. So, yeah, definitely something we're thinking about. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe next year when I'm back, I'll tell you how it went. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking about the friction thing earlier, too. Um, as far as, like, those dialogue boxes, I wonder how many of them are treated, you know, when, when people see those kind of things that are just an interference or something that gets in the way, you know, like a EULA, for example, people just click through it. Mm -hmm. So I'd wonder if, like, even changing the order of what those buttons are and not making it something that you can just hit tab and enter, for example, where they have to physically move, you know, move to it and say, yes, this is exactly what I want to do, um, if that would help, like, you know, prevent, preventing people from, from disclosing information that's not, you know, maybe they want to rethink what they actually chose. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There are a variety of ways of adding that friction, which might, um, instead of waiting a 10, cents, t 10 seconds, just, you know, that, that little bit of friction could be enough to make people think. Um, we, we've uh, separately done a study on, um, on pop-up warning dialogues, um, and one of the things we found is that if um, you force people to mouse over the important part of the dialogue, um, before they can click, you know, yes, um, then it does get people to reflect more and to be less likely to do something unsafe. So that would be interesting to apply in this case as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know if you, I didn't hear anything in the presentation today, but there's the aspect of posting something on a social media site about like being on vacation, where that might be a, a threat. You know, people might know that you're out of the house and people troll sites for things like that. You know, when you're not gonna be around to be burglarized or yeah. private pictures of your family that might be something you might not want to have posted your kids on the internet and then people will know you know, people look for stuff like that. Did you get any indication of people being concerned about things like this or looking for stuff like that? Uh, yeah, so there was, there was some concern about that. I think um, it's, it's a bigger concern, um, well, like the, the I, I'm on vacation sort of thing, is a bigger concern if you're posting publicly than if you're posting friends only. Um, and, you know, the, a lot has been made of people who post I'm on vacation and there, there's been um, blogs and lots of media reports about it. Um, I'm not actually convinced that as a threat vector that's actually a really uh, a big one um, that, uh, that, that you know that burglars are, are finding out that people are on vacation you know because because of that um, but I think a bigger concern is the um, the problem that that people have friends from different parts of their lives that are all in one friend list so I have my work colleagues and I have you know the people in my neighborhood and I have the parents of my kids friends and my relatives and we're all in one friend list and I might um, want to share the pictures of you know my kids running around in their bathing suits um, with a subset of those friends, but not with all of those friends. Um, and, um, and I think that, that that's, that's something that we saw was the needing to find the subset of the friend. And there may be ways that based on the content of the photo or the names mentioned in the post or things like that, um, you could actually suggest that maybe you need a subset. Um, of, of those people. Um, we, we actually did a study looking at um, photos specifically a while ago where we looked at um, the people tagged in a photo and what was you know, tagged in a photo and what access control people wanted to have. And we found that there was, you could use machine learning to actually predict based on the tags who should have access to what photos. And, and so that, that's um, an idea that, that could certainly be folded in here. I was wondering about the the study where you had people text you when they held back from posting something. If you had any information as to whether they felt that like scrap their because it kind of suggests an interesting nudge mechanism, some kind of like anonymous rant board. Maybe you mean to post here. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's a really good idea. Um, uh, I don't know if we had any data on that. Manya, do you know, if, did we collect anything? Uh, the, the, qu the question was, was did people get um, sort of satisfaction from texting us about the things they didn't post and maybe that kind of scratched their itch so they didn't need to post it after that? We had a couple of people say, you know, I, we thought of, I thought of you as sort of my, my invisible diary or like person to rant to. Um, I'm not sure if it was instead of posting, but they... Yeah. They, like, they like doing it. I'm not sure if it was there. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we, we've also kicked around the idea of, of having people post uh, to only me so they see it on their Facebook page and then, and then they can decide whether they want anybody else to see it or not. And, uh, and it may be that for some people they see it, you know, they've gotten off their chest and they're like, no, I don't need to share it any more than that. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, so, yeah. Do yeah. you have a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, just gonna say, I also thought an interesting mechanism would be you have all these people who say, oh, uh, this is good for me or good for a friend, and you have trouble judging like sarcasm. You could have anonymous review by other like f peer Facebook users who, you know, you're always going to have someone online, and they're like, I would react negatively if somebody read that. Chill yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we have actually some students who are just starting to think about how, how to build that kind of peer review mechanism. We, we'd like to experiment with that. Um, cause I, I think that, that could be to give you a much faster feedback than, um, than you might otherwise get. Yeah. Uh, here. Kind of connected to that, too. I don't know if, if people remember that site. I mean, there were so many of them, but uh, one of the more uh, popular ones was Group Hug. It was grouphug.us, I think. And what they did was they allowed you to post like whatever you were going to post elsewhere anonymously so that you could just get it out there and like I guess people could like vote on that and stuff like oh is this a good idea to post it or not that kind of thing so like you got feedback from an anonymous community and I guess as long as you didn't you know really reveal yourself by like naming names etc you had this ability to kind of like rant about something without people knowing who it was you know they didn't track the IP addresses or anything like that you know like so it was like a form to be able to do that without, you know, and getting a response without like subjecting your friends to it, for example. So. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting idea. If, if you can really maintain the anonymity, um, which is probably a big if, uh, yeah, that, that, that does seem like, like a good way to get feedback. Yeah. Any other questions? 
All right, thank you very much.